Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Now, I'm told I'm not allowed to use the Colin Vaudan uh, gag about Mrs. May because it's already been used, but um, if my voice does fail, I have a colleague in the audience who's going to read out my speech. Um, but actually, I don't need to do that because Emma's just done a pretty good job of giving my speech just now. So um, you, may, you may find, strangely enough, you bring two regulators together, they say some quite similar things. Um, I mean, it's... Uh, it was uh, sort of William McChesney Martin, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve in 1955. He said the Fed is in the position of a chaperone who ordered the punch bowl removed just when the party was really warming up. Uh, while much has uh, changed in the world of data in recent years, which of us hasn't marvelled at such populist works as Mayor Schoenberg's big data? The role of a regulator has a certain constancy in being here to tell unpopular truths at inconvenient times, which others, because of their desire for fame or fortune, find it much more difficult to tell. Like a monk, on becoming a regulator, you're meant to give up your quest for fame and fortune. Being able to do so enables it, it, it to be much easier to question popular established verities. To start by way of anecdote, this summer we employed an, an army of summer interns to sort through more than five million pages or about 1,750 boxes, scanning and shredding to make sure that by next spring, if not a bit beforehand, the Commission is in a position where it is GDPR compliant. Whilst this was a bureaucratic jaw, it will save us money on archive space in the longer term, and I'd certainly commend doing something similar. That said, my purpose today is not to talk to you about how to be GDPR compliant, but rather to talk about why, in my view, like Emma, it's critical that we're careful about big data. Let me start by reading you a few lines from the GDPR preamble. The processing of personal data should be designed to serve mankind. This regulation respects all fundamental rights and observes the freedoms pr and principles recognised in the Charter, as enshrined by the treaties, in particular the respect for private and family life, home and communications, the protection of personal data, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, freedom of expression and information, freedom to conduct business, the right to an effective remedy, to a fair trial, and cultural, religious and linguistic diversity. It's going to be on the consequences and the purpose of big data that I will speak today. Data is, all too often, not used to serve the common good. To give you some regulatory examples, some things which might be just pretty close to what might be described as big data, go into the construction of banks' internal models under Basel II and Basel III, and into insurance capital models under the EU Solvency II standard. As the financial crisis proved with regard to Basel II internal models, the fact that a lot of data went into them didn't make them good of themselves. The data in itself may have been reasonable in some cases, but the artifice which went into the bank's models was noteworthy. The assumptions embedded within the algorithms were proven by events to be in some cases naive, in some cases positively Machiavellian. In they, they were designed to paint a falsely comfortable picture about a whole series of exposures, which created, even under slightly stressed conditions, bankruptcy-inducing liabilities for the banks in question. Much good work has been done by my colleagues in the Bank of International Settlements in trying to improve the rules, so the models are better set up going forwards. But Next time anybody talks to you about big, day, big data being able to aid understanding and solve problems, it is as well to remember the role models played in the financial crisis and how the black boxes designed to help large banks and regulators understand and manage vast quantities of data were actually quite capable of compounding misinformation and burying decent leading indicators of problems without a trace. There is nothing, and I repeat nothing, innately wonderful about big data. It's the uses to which it is put and the hands which manipulate it, uh, which determine whether, to quote the EU, it serves mankind. I'd argue, and I need to step back a bit in history here, that over the fast four centuries in the West, there's been a symbiotic relationship between human progress and some of the human rights cited in the preamble to the GDPR. From a British perspective, we can perhaps look get back at the writings of John Locke in the 1680s, which justified the Whigs turning against the authoritarianism of James II and fermenting the glorious revolution, whose principles were codified into the 1688 Bill of Rights. That bill, of itself, 
did not guarantee complete freedom of speech, but it did guarantee freedom of speech within Parliament, as well as ensuring full religious freedom for Protestants, tantamount to freedom of speech, albeit couched in the rather clerical language of a more devout age. What this new toleration meant was that no one was allowed to use the coercive power of the state to enforce a particular view of truth. That was a truly revolutionary innovation. From this grew, through the 18th and 19th centuries, a culture in which provided that one did not threaten another with violence, there was very considerable freedom of speech, thought, and wealth permitting action. In this environment, mimicked to some degree by the United States through its Bill of Rights, science was free to question orthodox thinking, while industrialists were free to experiment with new means of production, which, whilst often enriching them, brought goods to the masses which were once preserved princes. Thus were spread broad foundations on which human progress could be built, both from the perspective of knowledge and material things. What is noteworthy about this great age of human progress between 1689 and 1914 was how often established wisdom was wrong. What made the British Isles and the fledgling American Republic different from most other nations was the way in which freedom of thought and speech were allowed, enabling a few brave souls the liberty to challenge, to prove their case, and to advance mankind without being unduly burdened by oppressive censorship and worse. This tradition of free critical thinking was one in which I, as a Cold War baby, was raised. The tradition in which both William Beveridge on the socialist side could write full employment in a free society, alongside Hayek's Road to Serfdom on the side of the libertarian right. This far more than the distribution of wealth is what divided the East and the West in the Cold War. We were free to speak the truth, or what we understood to be the truth, and they were not. I was brought up to consider this as possibly my most valuable birthright, that provided I did not threaten another human with violence, I could say what I wanted, and, at worst, people would merely dismiss me as an eccentric, well, nothing new there then, rather than seeking to sanction me for incorrect thinking. It was one of the things which made the UK special. Much has changed since I was a child. There have been huge further advances, often interestingly pioneered in the United States, a land whose constitution guarantees a considerably above average amount of freedom of speech and thought to those with the energy and resources to take advantage of it. The biggest advance, in so much that it has enabled a huge series of future advances, has perhaps been the internet. How many of you have read uh, George Orwell, 1984? Show of hands, please. Great. Yeah. I remember reading Orwell for the first time, being horrified not so much by the rats, was by the telescreen which listened to your every move, checking up that you were doing the things which Big Brother wished while refraining from thought crime. Now, not only do we have televisions which constantly monitor us in our own homes, but also toasters and kettles and nice little wristwatch-sized trinkets that can and do monitor every inward movement of our bodies 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, the Internet of Things is, I believe, the marketing term for the vast array of surveillance equipment now semi-voluntarily installed in many modern homes. Not content with this, tech companies have lured an astonishingly large proportion of the population into revealing their innermost concerns and fears online and sharing it, not with one or two trusted soulmates, but with everybody they've ever met, as well as a few others besides. This increase in monitoring by private and state sector actors combined with the vast increases in computing power requires to protest, process the immense amounts of data collected, have given rise to an ability to act. That is an ability to police deeds, speech, and thought of which a true totalitarian such as Stalin could only have dreamed. Many may say that such technological advances are benign, and while some technology company will sometimes overstep some privacy boundary and accidentally infringe Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights, it is benign because you are not breaking a law, and if you are not breaking a law, nobody is stopping you doing what you are doing. I would like, burning, building on the shoulders of others, not least of which Emma, to challenge such thinking. In order to effect some change, you normally need to be able to do, both do something and to wish to do it. It logically follows that freedom is threatened when forces with the ability to act in a way which constrains freedom 
are combined with forces which, with a will to act away in a way which constrains freedom. So again, you need both an ability and a will. I hope I've explained up to this point, in summary form, how structures with the ability to act against freedom exist at, at now, as never before in the history of human civilization. As I'm now going to talk about, the will to act to constrain freedom has increased markedly in the past few years in a number of ways. I don't want to talk much about politics per se today. I'll merely observe that Francis Fukuyama's thesis in The End of History in The Last Man, that Western liberal democracies triumph may single nor the end of socio-cultural human evolution was plain wrong. Since he wrote that in 1992, various ideological movements have embedded themselves within Western society. These ideologies threaten the hugely beneficial Western consensus, which has developed since the 1680s, that there should not be truths which are not open to challenge and intellectual debate. While one may choose to agree or disagree with some of the ideological movements, it's difficult to deny that some wings of each of these ideological movements have sought to use totalitarian means to suppress those wishing to exercise their freedom to challenge the beliefs of some in the movement. Such ideologues have, in their belief that their version of truth was so perfect, sought to put their truth on a pedestal beyond legal challenge. They have, in other words, expressed a will to suppress freedom of speech and thought. Turning to the commercial sector, here, sadly, the ability to act leads to an imperative to act. As Mayor Schoenberg has noted in Big Data of the de' Medici, in the 16th century, they became the most influential bankers in Europe, in no small part because they used a superior method of data recording, the double entry system. The case is scarcely different today with various tech companies having used their embedded data advantages to acquire positions which might most politely be described as oligopolistic. Some of you may be thinking that this doesn't really matter, as technology firms provide valued and ever-improving services to you and your families. My contention is that this exploitation of your data really does matter rather a lot. Let me make the impact of the Internet of Things and social networks real by turning to insurance. As some of you may be aware, I chair the risk committee of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, and whilst I don't claim to speak for IAS today, my work with it has developed my appreciation of the threat to freedom represented by the prospective use of big data by insurers and those seeking to act as service providers to insurance companies. Let me start with telematics. I can remember as a private sector strategy consultant more than 15 years ago working on a pitch to a major international car manufacturer to help develop its telematics strategy. The installation of monitoring tools in its cars to assist drivers and theoretically improve road safety, maintenance scheduling, etc. Many of the things which the firm was only just thinking about have now become near standard equipment on cars, not least of which are the so called black boxes, which track exactly where you drive, at what times of day, how fast, and of course they constantly assess whether you're starting to brake at the recommended distance before the junction, and they condemn you to the degree that your behaviour doesn't form within the norms of the model. I can remember passing my driving test as a youngish teenager, I think I was 17 and four months, and being able that very evening to drive off in my father's car for the first time. The sense of freedom and the possibilities which the endless roads presented were inspiring and empowering. How much less so in this fast approaching age, where every movement is monitored by a big brother insurance company, capable of cancelling your cover at next to no notice, or sending your parents nasty letters telling them how bad your driving has been. I certainly wouldn't have held my licence for long, I'll say that much. It also potentially allows covert discrimination by using other measures as proxy, proxies for gender difficult behaviours, thus, thus circumventing European court rulings that insurance must be gender neutral. Whilst many of you may think that insurance shouldn't, in fairness to girls who get charged a fortune for car insurance, be gender neutral, um, the the fact remains that this is sort of what I call a soft example of freedoms being indirectly damaged and potentially of illegal discrimination potentially being able to take place through the back door of big data. Then, I'm sticking with my insurance industry examples then, is what we like to term, or what some people like to term, individually tailored insurance. Such a nice marketing term that. Who, after all, wouldn't want their friendly web bopped or even their real insurance advisor tailoring their insurance policy to meet their needs, ensuring they didn't pay for cover they didn't require? I fear the reality becomes somewhat more sinister 
as insurance becomes less of a commodity with pooled risk and more of a one-way bet for the insurer against you. What it could mean, via the use of big data, is that insurance companies trawl through reams of data held about you by technology companies and develop new algorithms based on their combining of lost data with technology company data gathered through social network and the Internet of Things to identify new key risk factors for the provision of insurance. Thus, let me make it real. That like which you gave to your friend's ironic Greek holiday snap could potentially put £20 or so on your car insurance because the insurer's big data black box says that people who like Greek holiday photographs on a social network are statistically 5% more likely to have a serious car accident. Um, it doesn't seem so much fun, suddenly, does it, this big data? Um, trouble is, to be honest, you can't blame the insurance companies for it because it's a case of eat or be eaten. If they don't do this, assuming the algorithms make some technical sense, their rivals will do it better and undercut them on pricing for all the lower risk customers, leaving the insurer which rejects big data with merely the loss making customers. Lastly, still with insurance, let me turn to a really serious potential issue involving insurance. We now live in a world where you can take a sample, you know, a bit of skin or something, have it sent off for genetic profiling. Your doctors also do this thing, so work out what might be going wrong with you or might, what might go wrong with you in the future. It all sounds good until you realise that you, uh, your insurers or ag agents could also find a way to access that information as part of their haul of big data to evaluate whether you'd be a suitable individual to give health insurance to. Even if you're very careful about your privacy, you might find a close relative has done such a genetic profile and your insurer will look out, work, work out the relationship and extrapolate from there. Suddenly, because of something over which you've got absolutely no control, because of something you were born with, or because you have a disabled relative, you fo you'll find you can't afford insurance premiums and your family has no medical cover. Suddenly the loss of the historic pooling of medical risk by insurers, which served the common good, even while it required those who were very healthy, and therefore, of course, statistically much more likely to be high earners, to pay more, might seem rather a shame. In fact, depending on where you live, where there's a viable state-funded health sector, it might be quite literally terminal. Big data comes with big risks to society, and particularly to vulnerable elements of society. I'm not saying it's working like that here and now, but I am saying that big data enables a quiet return to the sort of eugenics rejected by Western society after the defeat of Germany in 1945, and that there are clear commercial pressures on insurance companies to go down such disturbing avenues in their use of big data. With the above theoretical examples about insurance, I hope I've shown some of the risks posed to Western society by the untrammeled use of big data, but by one small part of the financial service sector, and the chilling effect which that could have on freedom of movement, on affordability, and on health outcomes. I'm now going to turn away from insurance to, some to something sometimes called reg tech, the use of big data by regulators. I'm sure that's really terrifying for a number of you in the room, but uh, uh, it's very interesting how it can work. A chap called Professor Cousin, who is, uh, works at IMD in Switzerland, wrote a book called Inspiring S Stewardship, which set out how his team had used qualitative big data, annual reports and so forth, words, not numbers, to deduce on the basis of certain sets of words, whether some companies were well run or badly run. For example, companies which could reasonably regard as being well run tend to use emphatic words such as absolute, always, completely, never, ever, a lot. They also use the word yes more frequently than other companies. Conversely, potentially badly run companies use extreme words to describe customer complaints and financial performance. Extraordinary, super while using the word no more than other companies. There were different traits depending on what area of a company was being discussed. For staff matters, the better rated companies used words such as aligned, bonuses, career, colleagues, compensation, recognition a lot, whereas potentially badly run companies used words such as appraisal, assigned, dismissed, evaluated, job, hire, or rather say more. If anybody wants to go back and look at their annual reports and see what they've got written in them, I'm sure they'll find some interesting lessons there. Um, what, what, what Professor Cousin has shown with a reasonable degree of scientific rigour is how certain words can be, in a big data world, used to deduce whether we are good or bad, competent or incompetent, and so forth. If we substitute Professor Cousin's focus on formal annual corporate filings as a means of judging goodness and badness, 
and consider the alternative source of everything we have said within microphone distance of our smartphone in the last two years, we may like to pause for reflection. How truly free can we be, we be in a world of big data to express our real views on anything and to challenge established orthodoxies without automatic condemnation with real adverse consequences for our, our lives by programs analysing big data? This is not to say that there are not considerable advantages from the perspective of some innovation, from some innovations offered by big data. I'm not sitting here trying to say there's no good, there's an awful lot of good in it. Certainly it's possible to see how it's gathering and analysis of data from the homes of older people living alone could potentially allow them to remain safely in their homes far longer than is currently the case, possibly allied to robotics able to deliver some caring services. What I am saying is that we need to be cautious because of how potentially threatening it is to critical rights and freedoms. I'm sure all of you can't recite every part of the UN's 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I, thus, I looked them up while preparing this talk, and I found that there were uh, a number threatened by unmediated use of big data. Um, articles 1, 12, 13, 17, 19, and 18, to be precise. I can make a similar uh, list from the European Convention of Human Rights as the EU did in its preamble to the GDPR. As Schoenenberg uh, observes, in the era of big data, the three core strategies long used to ensure privacy, individual notice and consent, opting out and anonymization, have lost much, much of their effectiveness. They also observe that the problem with relying on big data predictions, such as those set out above with regard to the insurance sector, is that doing so negates the very idea of the presumption of innocence the principle upon which our legal system, as well as our sense of fairness, is based. And if we hold people responsible for predicted future acts, ones they may never commit, we also deny that humans have a capacity for moral choice. To this, it's also worth adding the issue of who is undertaking this deprivation of rights. Locke observed in his second treatise on government 300 years ago that the legislative neither must nor can transfer the power of making laws to anyone else or place it anywhere but where the people have, i.e. you can't take the power of making laws away from the people. But with big data, we come frighteningly close to that already. The commercial entities undertaking the development and exploitation of big data have arrived at a situation where their actions could come pretty close to lawmaking because of the pervasive power they have to enforce their big data to drive judgments on a large populations. How long, after all, is it? How many of you have, after all, tried uh, to use your Apple phone without signing up to whatever use of big data which Apple wants to make of it? You can't do it, can you? You have no choice. Um, big tech are not locks people or any other people recognizable as a description of those upholding the democratic will. When the exploitation of big data challenges so many human rights, dearly won by the West in the 1940s, rights built on the received wisdom of our ancestors, as to what a highly civilised society could and should represent. We may have cause for caution. What then of this paradox of my title? It's simply this. Historically, advocates of freedom have defended a limited state on the basis that a pervasive state would threaten freedom. We may now have arrived at a situation where, in order to defend freedom and the human rights closely associated with that freedom, we may require rather more pervasive regulation of those exploiting big data to ensure that their actions do not breach Article 17 of the European C Convention. That, by the way, prohibits any group or person from engaging in any activity or act aimed at the destruction of any of the human rights. Thus, the protection of human rights, the protections of the freedoms over which have over the last th past three and a half centuries helped the West advance civilization and human well-being require the increased regulation of the commercial se sector to stop it privatizing lawmaking and de facto adversely affecting human freedoms. I appreciate that may be an uncomfortable message to some in this room, and certainly I think it's an uncomfortable message from a couple of the speeches I've just heard, but I think we should be wor worry a lot. I think it's deeply ironic, given that it was only the freedoms of the West which created a climate in which the private sector could develop such extraordinary data, data processing capabilities that one now needs to regulate to protect those, those freedoms. If that sounds complex, it's because I think it is quite complex. I honestly think, and I don't say this very often, 
that the European Commission has made a praiseworthy start to the endeavour of preserving freedom with the GDPR, irritatingly bureaucratic, though many of us find its implementation. I believe the technology is moving so fast and the commercial pressures companies are experiencing to exploit big data as such, that more will need to be done soon at an international level. This is difficult territory, both for public servants and for those in the commercial sector. I'm afraid I don't see many easy answers, and I hope that some of the solutions which other people in this room have put forward for Guernsey today can help. What I do believe is that the politicians of the leading countries need to address this clear and present threat which big data can present to human freedom. They need to act without further delay if the human rights of which we have enjoyed are to be upheld and that we're not to find that big data suppresses our freedom of speech and thought going forwards. Thank you very much.